Um, I, I think, you know, we were always a small community under Mubarak, uh, and with the usual smears, uh, smear campaigns on a sort of cyclical basis. So none of the accusations uh, brought against human rights activists recently are new. In fact, they're all very recycled and uncreative. You know, foreign agents, foreign funding, a Western agenda, uh, double standards. Why do you only work on civil and political rights and not on economic? Uh, you hear these kinds of arguments again and again. Why are you focusing only on this particular group and not on everything else? So a lot of those were, were used to. I think what changed, what the, I think the change really came in early 2011. Because early 2011, the sort of honeymoon period after the uprising, was a moment when for the first time independent members of the human rights community, because they've always been, you know, gongos in Egypt, so governmental, non-governmental organizations, human rights organizations who uh, are, are close, were close to the Mubarak regime and only did training and never really did much criticizing. So their status was always much friendlier towards the government. But what changed in 2011 is that the independent um, members of the human rights community suddenly had access to the media, they had access to state media, had access to private media. Um, you know, you'd see people like Hassan uh, Baghdad and Gamal Eid who were never really on television on the Mubarak, suddenly regularly on the political talk shows. Uh, talking about human rights became part of the central political discussion. And of course, the human rights community never creates political moments. The, the change we push for is always quite minimal, it's quite specific. We pick corners and we work on them. We try for releases, we try for a change in policy here, for a change in the law there. But when there is a political moment like the moment we had in early 2011, that's the kind of moment that empowers the human rights community. And so it wasn't just access to the media, uh, political parties were drawing on the expertise of human rights organizations, the government was inviting human rights organizations for meetings, for consultations about uh, you know, all of the things that, uh, that we thought were, were possible in early 2011. So legislative reform plans, uh, security sector reform, um, and obviously work on accountability was also a consistent theme because what the protest movement was calling for from that first day uh, um, in, in January 2011 was for accountability, for justice. And uh, that's a, been a core part of our work for years and years and years. And the reason we're so obsessed with accountability is not just because we you know, believe in it for the sake uh, because of some abstract belief in justice, but because uh, the shift you know, the, the shift in power that I wanted to see in January 2011, and that I'm still fighting for, is to know that security forces will no longer be above the law. That security forces, that the, the empower the justice system vis-a-vis -vis security forces. And, and, and that's why it appeared, at least in the first few months of 2011, when the trials went forward, um, and when a calls for justice were still being made in the street, it appeared that, that this was a moment of empowerment. I think over 2011, that, uh, that power waned as the military realized it could actually contain the protest movement and didn't need to be so worried about it. And from, I, I, for me, the turning point was probably June 2011 onwards, when the, you saw the military going on the attack and attacking uh, April 6 and calling them foreign agents. And then you saw an increase in violence um, the violence never really went away, but you saw an, an increase in the kind of brutality with things like Mespido happening in August 2011. And then the Mohammed Mahmoud crisis comes. And Mohammed Mahmoud, obviously, the, the anniversary is uh, on the 19th, uh, next week. And the reason I think this was one of the most interesting moments was that over five days, we have over 45 protesters killed uh, by the police, uh, obviously with the military overseeing it. So for the military to call, you know, for there to be a call to, uh, to protest on the 19th and support uh, of the military is, is somewhat surreal. Um, the, this protest is originally called for, it, is an, it starts off with an Islamist protest. Um, because the Muslim Brotherhood and others protest for one day when, uh, when a set of super constitutional principles are put on the table. And these super constitutional principles came up with criteria to limit the appointment of members of the constituent assembly. And that's what the Brotherhood were protesting against. But it also included a set of military privileges. And that, that, that the protest was initially called for by the Brotherhood is, is, is ironic on multiple levels. I mean, first of all, because if you look at some of the content of 
uh, the privileges that the military were pushing for in the super constitutional principles, many of them actually ended up in the 2012 constitution, which was drafted and passed by the Brotherhood, including uh, embedding the right of the military justice system to try civilians, and uh, also embedding, um, you know, giving the military justice system sole jurisdiction over military officers, which is de facto uh, immunity from prosecution for the military, longer term. It's also ironic because the Brotherhood had, had called for that one protest on the first day and very quickly distanced themselves and refused to participate in the protest that took place over those following days. And for those of you who are there, that was really, <coughs> for me, one of, the one of the most powerful moments since January 2011, just because of the numbers who were out there in Haman Mahmoud, but also because the call at that time was down with military rule. And I saw that as part of a very healthy trajectory uh, throughout 2011, whereby, because of course what happened on February 11th was not a revolution, it was the culmination of a genuine popular uprising that the authorities had never expected with a soft military coup where the SCAF decided to get rid of Mubarak because it was too costly to keep him in power. And so that's why over that year we had a year and a half of military rule. And so for the first time I felt that the protest movement was actually taking on the power behind the throne, which was the military. The protest movement, so our, our work, you know, every crisis is to say X number of protesters killed, we want to see accountability. To keep banging on about accountability on every single opportunity and talking about impunity. So it's interesting that in response to this, for, you know, for me, first major crisis uh, <laughs> since the uprising that the military faced, it's interesting that two of the things that the military did in response was to refer to trial one officer for the virginity tests that the military conducted, uh, subjected female, protest female protesters in prison, in military prison to in March 2011. And the second one was they referred to trial three soldiers who were driving the APCs at Maspiro, who crushed protesters. Neither of these cases, I mean, first of all, the only officer who was put on trial for the virginity test was ultimately acquitted, and the Maspiro case looked only at the APC drivers and not at the shooting, at the use of live ammunition that night. So very, very popular very a tiny corner of, of um, what we would have wanted to see in terms of accountability. But interesting that their response is to say, we'll give them a trial. We'll give them some, uh, some, some accountability. Also interesting that the Brotherhood, of course, stays silent throughout this period. Um, when I first started working on human rights, I kind of learned about human rights from the Brotherhood, or not from the Brotherhood, but based on Brotherhood arrests. I mean, military trials of civilians is a very technical issue. Uh, it, not, not something that you would think that would, would actually you know, create um, mass uh, outrage or mobilize protesters. But the reason we learned about it was because the brothers would be, were tried under Mubarak uh, using military trials. That was the ultimate punishment. If you were, you know, if Mubarak was a bit pissed at you, he put you in a state security court. If he was very pissed at you, you'd get a military trial. And yet, throughout the period of 2011, the brothers were silent when it came to military trials of civilians. And I know from the conversations that I had that you know we often try and get, including you know the Brotherhood of Human Rights lawyers or Brotherhood lawyers who worked on human rights cases, um, uh, you know, say, well, are you worried about military trials of civilians? So a conversation I had with Abdelmenem Masoud, for example, um, in, in the middle of 2011. Uh, no, we're not worried. You know, we have good access to the military justice system these days. When there's a problem, we just we go and discuss it. Um, are you worried about? What about torture? What, what are you doing about torture? Um, and security sector on torture, you know, issue you, you, you campaigned on for years. Um, yeah, no, we're not worried now. We gave uh, Mansour and Esawi, the then Minister of Interior, we gave him a list of all the state security officers we didn't want, uh, we wanted uh, to see, um, we, wanted, uh, we wanted gone, and they uh, transferred them. So the Brotherhood's way of dealing with what for us were human rights issues that should be dealt with through a process, through accountability, was throughout 2011 to deal with it through negotiations with the military. And they had a good working relationship. And that's, of course, the, the, the other irony uh, in looking at, uh, at where, we are, where we are today. Parliament um, is in session from January to June 2012. And at the time, again, you know, we're trying to push for a law on transitional justice to be passed. We're trying to push for amendments to the, the Code of Military Justice to limit, to, to, to ban military trials of civilians. Um, there's a draft anti-torture law, there's a draft protest law, and a draft NGO law. And throughout this time, again, another very new experience. 
Uh, I'm uh, being invited along with other Egyptian human rights defenders to attend uh, small committee sessions in Parliament. They're asking us for draft language, for comparative examples of other laws. Uh, publicly, and this is both you know liberal and uh, Islamist uh, MPs, because honestly it's the first time they've looked at the protest in their lives and they have zero legislative experience. So I mean they, they were actually quite open to a lot of quiet um, technical assistance if you believe if you want, but of course publicly saying we reject all foreign anything. Uh, but privately saying, could you give me some examples of, of how this works in, in other countries? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was really, again, it, it was another interesting moment um, because, you know, at least in the Human Rights Committee and Magnus Shab at the time, it had it had a very, it had Amr Hamzawi, it had a Brotherhood representatives at Noor, and it had some hardcore fulul sitting around the table and and actually discussing legislation. So I wasn't. I mean, I have to say I was also fairly optimistic at the time that, uh, that we would at least perhaps see on a few issues some good legislation, in particular on torture, because that was a consensus issue. Um, but, but the Brotherhood, which controlled Parliament, had little interest in pushing forward this legislation. They could have. They had six months. And they controlled it. I mean, I remember conversations with the Noor party representatives who often, you know, sort of quietly complain uh, uh, about the Brotherhood reps because some of the Noor, Noor MPs were actually far more progressive, whereas, you know, the Brotherhood MPs, you could talk to them as much as you want, but decision making on legislation was very centralized. So they weren't actually going to engage with you at the committee level because they were making the decisions. So then we had this bizarre parallel advocacy strategy where for anti-torture law, for the NGO law, for the protest law, we go and speak to the MPs in the committee. We then speak to the head of the FJP uh, legislative committee in the party. And then we also try and find people in the guidance bureau to lobby because that's, you know, that was basically how decision making was <coughs> made through, through those different parts, not as MPs uh, in, independently. I'm, I'm glad that we tried that experience because um, I don't think you, I, mean, I, think, I think every political party had choices throughout the last two years how to position itself. I don't think anyone could have assumed going in that it was pointless to try X, Y, Z because the Brotherhood would never do, you know. I, I, think, I think the Brotherhood had choices. And initially, after Morsi was elected in, from about July to November, I mean, the turning point was obviously the, the Constitution Declaration in November. It also seemed that there was a choice on the table. He set up two committees, uh, a fact-finding committee that would look at a year and a half of uh, abuse against protesters, and a committee to review detention. And one of the signs of, I mean, one of the things that we were, were, were some of us optimistic about is that this time at least we had two people from the Independent Human Rights Committee community on, on the both committees. So Ahmed Radib sat on the fact-finding committee, and Ahmed Saif uh, sat on the committee for detainees. Now the committee, the work of the committee for detainees was very problematic because they didn't end up making an overall human rights recommendations for the release of all civilians tried by military tribunals, but they were partial, it was sort of a negotiation with the Ministry of Interior in terms of who the Ministry of Interior was happy to have released. So that was not a successful experience uh, overall, even though they did get some witnesses. The second committee, of course, the fact-finding committee, actually got some good stuff finished their report end of December, and then Morsi sat on it and refused to issue it. Um, I, I still think, I'm you know, personally, I'm still trying to push for the release of that uh, of that report because I know that they got some good stuff from Mohammed Mahmoud, and I know that they got some very good stuff on the cabinet violence in December 2011. And the, what these reports do is that they give us a basis to fight certain battles. You, you may have, if you haven't read the judgment in the Mubarak trial, the judge ultimately ends up um, convicting Mubarak on the, on the basis of his failure to protect protesters from attacks by foreign criminal elements and ends up saying that he's not convinced that there is any evidence that the police shot protesters in January 2011. That decision has been over, you know, it, it was overturned by the Court of Cassation and is now a retrial, but what, what stands there is that you have no recognition of the fact that the police killed people in January 2011. And that's why these fact-finding reports are actually an important basis. We engage, we engage with those reports and we feed them what, what, they, what we have. Um, and then the Constitutional Declaration comes. And the Constitutional Declaration is obviously followed by pushing through the Constitution at a moment when, um, as you will remember, both the Liberals and the Treasury representatives had walked out. 
the 2012 Constitution for me was a serious regression in terms of rights protections, uh, even compared to the 71 Constitution. And then the Hadaya happens. And I think the Hadaya is one of the, at least for the, for the Morsi era, was the defining moment for all of us in the human rights community. Because after having documented an incident where Brotherhood members themselves were, uh, you know, openly admitted that they broke up a, a sit-in because protesters were insulting uh, the president, um, and then set up their own little detention center outside presidential palace gate number four, and actually abuse protesters and then film this and put this on, on television. After that incident, we could no longer we could no longer operate on the basis that there may be people uh, of good faith within the system who, for again, you don't lobby government officials because you think they like human rights or because they believe in human rights, but purely because at some level they understand that this will make them look good. And after it had they, it became it became difficult to to, to even uh, make make that assumption. I can talk to you more about the trial later on because it's, it's, it's very problematic the way the trial is going forward and incredibly selective. But from that moment on, uh, the human rights community is, is kind of back in fashion. You know, Lamis Khalidi invites me to go on to CBC and talk about uh, the nasty brotherhood uh, and, and all their human rights violations uh, after, of course, being completely uninterested in human rights around 2011 and 2012. Uh, we are, you know, we are integrated into Fulul Central uh, in a sense because uh, all of the private media wants to talk about the violations uh, by Morsi. At the same time, the Brotherhood themselves are, are also no longer playing, yes, we care about human rights, we're the ones who are abused the most, we're the ones who are tortured the most, therefore police reform is a priority for us, which is the line that they were constantly using. And, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, I write a report on it today and I get called into the presidency to be told off. Uh, the presidency emails Reuters and tells them, CCing me after I'd given a quote to them, you, you, you should not believe him, right. So they were, they were, they also were annoyed by, uh, by the human rights community. And of course, when the constitution is passed, you have people like Subhi Saleh saying openly that the constitution was drafted to resist that nasty international treaty called CEDAW, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, because that was going to destroy uh, the Egyptian family. Um, so, uh, so fairly, you know, fairly, I think that shift within the Brotherhood, which is somewhat reflective also of uh, their relationship to these pro-revolution forces that Morsi had initially tried to gather around him in his uh, to be Shafiq in the elections, that shift there showed that in post-constitutional declaration they were going it alone, uh, they didn't feel they needed to seek uh, or that they wanted to seek uh, that kind of broader legitimacy and they weren't investing uh, in, in, uh, in pretending to uh, uphold human rights in any way. Fast forward to June 30th. On July 3rd, um, right after I heard the CC speech, I, I switched the station because I wanted to see the reaction I got on. And the, the screen on the Muslim Brother TV station it ha had gone blank. And then within hours, we heard about the arrest of Qatari. And so for me, you know, the question of how you feel about June 30th is actually a very separate one from how you feel about July 3rd and what happened on. And what we've been trying to explain throughout the last few months is that you can be pro-military, you can love Sisi, you can hate the brother, you can be fully in support of the overthrow of an elected president, uh, you can pretend it's not a coup, you can, you, know, you, can, you can call it whatever you want, but what, it, what does that have to do with the giving a blank check to the authorities to conduct, you know, to, to then commit the kind of human rights violations, which is the bread and butter stuff that we've been working on for the last few years. The station shut down, there are five organizations within the human rights community in Egypt who criticize it because we're against allowing the executive to collectively shut down, to shut down a station because that's collective punishment. If individual journalists have incited, against, have incited violence, then the state is justified in prosecuting them. That's a crime. But you should never shut down a station in, in, in the way that the stations were shut down on, on July 3rd. And that was sort of the first challenging question for us in the United States. The, the, the next challenge came very quickly, July 8th, outside the Republican Guard. Now, 
you know, excessive use of force by the military or by the police is something we've documented time and time again. And we know that if there's even a hint of violence on the side of protesters, both the military and the, and the police use that as enough of an excuse to then move into full-blown full -blown force as a response. So again, there's nothing new there. And you don't need to deny, uh, you know, you can fully recognize that there's some violence on the side of protesters, mostly stone throwing, Molotov cocktails, and with at least a couple of firearms, and still come up with a human rights conclusion that says that the military used excessive force because it killed 51 protesters, and there was one police officer and one military officer killed. That kind of analysis, which is exactly the same analysis that we used in January 2013 uh, to analyze the Port Said um, incident, where 46 protesters were killed over three days after two policemen were killed, that analysis then becomes, um, I mean, I've just never, I've never been so viciously attacked as I was in those first two weeks, even talking about human rights, even saying this is part of continuum of work on policing and the military becomes, uh, becomes taboo. The few human rights organizations who are still criticizing, and who are criticizing what happens, are then smeared, and the usual accusations of foreign agents, uh, or the new one, of course, of being a brotherhood supporter, being part of the International Brotherhood, being uh, working for the US um, uh, to further uh, um, a brotherhood agenda, comes up again and again and again. And, and it doesn't matter how often you say, excuse me, two minutes ago I was criticizing Morsi, uh, we did the same thing in Port Said. And that, doesn't, that doesn't resonate. It doesn't resonate not just with the private media stations, uh, but also with many of the uh, you know, revolutionary is a, is a word that no longer has any meaning, honestly, because it's, it's shipped as, I mean, Fulul is a word, you know, the Brotherhood word Fulul in 2012. It's, these words are difficult to use, but the groups that were in support of January 2011 and continue to push for some of these uh, human rights uh, battles, to push for accountability, to push for security and protective reform, to push for an end to peace, peace, those, most of those forces now attack the human rights community, they attack the members of the human rights community who are critical. Because of course there's also a split within the human rights community. And this split um, became incredibly obvious um, when it comes to Rabah. And, and I'll talk about that and then end on that so that we can have a bit of a discussion. This analysis, I am not talking about what the Brotherhood did or didn't do throughout this period. I documented violence on the part of Brotherhood protesters on, on July 2nd, on July 5th. You know, why did they send out a protest that went near Tahrir on July 5th? What happened in Bin Sarayat? Uh, what was happening in the sit-ins? What happened in Nahda? Uh, abuse of detainees in Nahda, in Rabaa. All of this stuff acknowledged, absolutely. But the Brotherhood are not a state. And the, the onus is ultimately on the state. At this point, the Brotherhood are out of power, and these have become criminal acts. And the response, the state has a right to arrest people, but it doesn't have a right to go in and to kill dozens of them. This is sort of the basic argument we were trying to make. And even that doesn't resonate. You know. Ibrahim Aisa dedicates a whole episode to bashing the human rights community. We stop being invited onto television for the most part. The, July 8th is a difficult one because it involves the military. And because, you know, at the time, the Brotherhood strategy again themselves, you know, the question as to why why did they go and camp out again in front of the Republican Guard on Salah Salem Street? Uh, you know, anyone could have sworn that a sit-in on Salah Salem Street was going to be broken up sooner or later. Those are questions of political strategy that, that are beyond the remit of a human rights analysis. But I understand also that, uh, you know, historically that support for the military remained high throughout the last few years. July 27th, however, was the police. And the police ended up killing 91 people, 91 people on Nostra Street in front of the Manassa. I've seen the police use excessive force and when they used birdshot, they killed two. But this, night, this evening, they used live gunfire as if it was birdshot. And they killed 91 people. And then we get to Rawa. And I, I think, in a sense, I think this, the general societal acceptance of what happened on July 8th and July 27th set the stage for what happened in Rawa. Because the authorities decided that they could get away with the death toll. The death toll that they had um, in, in their planning was that, uh, you know, we think, the cabinet had said we think it'll be around 700. And the Minister of Interior on another occasion estimated 3,000. 
And so if you read the Biblewi interview in, uh, in September in Masri Yom, he said that there were a thousand people killed that day, and this was less than expected. And the Ministry of Interior is still congratulating itself that there weren't 3,500 dead, only 1,000. And the Minister of Interior in his press conference on August 14th said that, um, that this was the internationally acknowledged standard of 10% losses for any dispersal of a protest. <laughs> um, I will never forget what I saw that day. Uh, not just the bodies, not just the sets of people being trapped in that space, but the fact that there was no access in or out of the hospital. The fact that the police, uh, the, the military and the police wouldn't let people uh, take, uh, take um, the wounded and, and, and the dead out. The fact that people had to go in their private cars after the sit-in was broken up uh, later in the evening at around 8 p.m. to move the bodies from the site of Rabaa to uh, the Imen Mosque and they were carrying them uh, on the roofs of the private cars. And, and if I won't forget it, then and how, what kind of impact does that have on all the people who are in the Rabaa sit-in? The last time the of Rabaa was 80,000 on, on a full day. And again, I'm not denying that there were some firearms on the side of protesters. In fact, there were at least three incidents throughout the day where there was automatic fire from the side of protesters. And I'm not denying that the police are badly trained and that they don't know how to target properly. But what happened that day was more than bad targeting. What happened that day was that the police, from very early on in the morning, when the first uh, deaths happened on the police side, used that to then shoot into the crowd, basically. And there's still a controversy over the ultimate death toll. The Ministry of Health uh, hasn't put out the final death toll yet for that day. <coughs> the Minister of Interior is saying it was only 40. Uh, the Ministry of Health's initial number was 288. Just I think we're looking at something in the region, I mean, something between seven, seven to 800. And uh, there are several organizations also working on, 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 on lists and documentation lists. I'm ending with Raba because Raba is the ultimate test of whether whether you believe in human rights or not. For me. And I think it's the ultimate test for our human rights community in Egypt. Thirty-four organizations put out a statement after Raba praising the police for dispersing the system consistent with international standards. I it's it's not very it's not very this is our dirty laundry. Yeah? I should really be talking about the internal workings of the human rights community in this way. But honestly, on a moment like this, you know, you can put out a statement saying that you're investigating and you don't have conclusions yet. Uh, but you, you can't put out a statement praising the police after that kind of death toll. Nine organizations put out a statement criticizing the dispersal uh, of the city that day. And the reason talking about these, these massacres, these killings, is important, and it's important for the future of Egypt, is that the battle for rule of law, the battle to try, you know, to, 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 to make security services aware that they will not get away with murder, that one day they could be prosecuted, to try and empower the civilian voices in government, even the good guys, you know, people like Ziad Bahedin, for me, who I'm a big fan of, it's, it's all about reigning in the security services, and right now, Political decision making in Egypt is being made solely by the security services. And that's one part of it, the balance of power. The other part of it is that you know, the government now is talking about this roadmap in the same way that Morsi in late 2012 was talking about the constitution. His obsession with the constitution at the time, if Hadeya was happening, hundreds of thousands of people were outside of Hadeya protesting the constitutional creation. And Morsi was saying the constitution will bring political stability. And how did that help him ultimately? And so the question for me now is this obsession by the authorities in thinking that this constitution, which may end up being great on human rights, or much better than the 2012 constitution on some issues, obviously not military privileges, but to assume that you can push forward a constitution or the process of elections without dealing with the severe polarization in Egyptian society, without dealing with the massacres, you know, pretending Rabah didn't happen, painting over the square, not talking about it, uh, for me is, is what is, you know, what is most disturbing about this moment we're in Egypt right now. I think we're going to stop on that happy note, should <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's just give him a round of applause.
have a discussion. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question, hi. Since you ended on Lebanon, and, uh, my work is mainly on Lebanon and Syria. And for the past few years, there was a general assumption that the Egyptian military would face a crisis if it were to actually mimic or mirror the tactics of, let's say, an organization like the Syrian army. That is, the assumption was that a death toll of a certain scale and certain specific tactics uh, cannot be done by this Egyptian military elite and officer corps. And, of course, Rabba, I mean, as an incident, uh, going back in modern Egyptian history, we can't really find a parallel. Egypt went through several dictators, British presence, what have you. But other than wartime casualties, this number is not something usual. Syria had Hamad, and now it has the current situation. Of course, Lebanon is a mess, and that's something else. But how is, I mean, is anyone now actually writing about, or working about, of what kind of military elite is in presence now, and what kind of like military culture is being cultivated? That is, in Syria, we've always known a specific officer corps coming from a specific community will always kill in mass. The, the othering is there. They, they're trained to do that. In Iraq, the Roman Guard Corps and Saddam Hussein, again, people from a specific community, they could kill in mass, and these are not us, we will murder all. Egypt didn't have that, and suddenly now we're seeing that. Is anyone actually talking about that, writing about that? Uh, or? I think there isn't enough talking and writing and thinking about Rabah in general and state responses to it. But I don't really have insights into the inner working of the military. I mean, obviously, you've seen that from the beginning, the Brotherhood were trying to argue that there were splits within the military and that there was actually a core that was sympathetic to the Brotherhood, and they would, uh, and they, you know, they were trying to use that very much, which is, um, I, I can't think of anything that pisses the military off more uh, than, than even uh, suggesting splits within the military. I think it's not coincidence that it was the police that conducted this operation. Because after the Republican Guard, I mean, that was the only incident where the military actually deployed. And from then onwards, they let the police, they let the police take the responsibility. If you're asking me whether I think the military uh, is going to be challenged by the Rabah incident, then I, I think no. I mean, I think, I think this incident has successfully been sold as um, the brothers were all armed and we went in and this is part of a fight on terror. And of course, I mean, again, I haven't gone into the attacks on churches, the attacks on police stations, could this happen that day, but I haven't gone into it because that's irrelevant to the analysis of how the police actually disperse a single sit-in. There are members of the Brotherhood who have committed crimes, and I want to see them prosecuted. I mean, I want, personally, some of the people on trial, in the Mursi trial, two of them at least, are in the videos in Hadeya torturing people. So this is a politicized trial, and, you know, it's part of the crackdown, but I want to see them prosecuted. So there's no question there. But overall, is there, you know, beyond outside brotherhood and brotherhood sympathizer ranks, is there pressure for accountability for Rabah? I would say no. Even, you know, the National Council for Human Rights, they've set up a fact finding committee. And uh, it's a bit weird because I went to speak to them two weeks ago, and here it's a fact finding committee, yeah, 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 we're going to produce a report in Shafi. And then instead of having a broader discussion about accountability, they're like, no, no, it's not the time for accountability. <laughs> <laughs> but, Apart from that, the government hasn't even done what Shafi did in February 2011. Shafi set up a fact finding committee. Again, Taban, of course, to absorb anger, not for anything, but again, a fact finding committee is the first tool. And, and at least in the short term, um, that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're fighting for. But broader implications for the military, I, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert on the inner workings of the military, and the country, but it seems to me that Sisi is very much in control that the Tafweed on uh, July 26 uh, is, is part of that control, and and I don't honestly see that kind of challenge to him emanating from Rabah. And it's and, and instead, you know, I keep talking about it in terms of accountability, but of course, for the broader population, Rabah has become a symbol of brotherhood, of anti-coup activism, and uh, and that's not that's not a human rights battle. That's a, that's a political battle. 
talking about the thing that the human rights activists in Egypt are rather a small community and that it had not been always easy to bring the human rights questions and human rights abuses such as torture uh, to a broader discussion with relevant people. I've been just wondering how much like regular Egyptians had been aware before the revolution about such a human rights abuses <coughs> and to what extent the revolution has changed this awareness. And then I have just one small question. You have mentioned the critical statement of the nine human rights organizations to Rabah. Can you just name uh, some of them? Thank the you. petition's online, okay. by the way, so okay. I can send you the link. Um, um, the young man in the back, and then one of them will do another round uh, Do you think the fact that the human rights organizations are uh, like more professional than not very much of volunteer based as in uh, outside the Egypt, for example. Does that add the fact that human rights uh, have become like human rights issues in uh, particular become politicized? Because I remember the only one who talks in, uh, who makes a proxy about uh, uh, the legal uh, the legal uh, 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 our political uh, 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 movements like uh, set up the or um, I want to thank you for your wonderful presentation and for sharing with us your story. And one of the things that sort of, you know, I kept hearing again and again in your narrative is that, you know, a lot of the attention towards and understanding of human rights really depended on the media focus as well as the popular opinion in the nation. And even what you're talking about right now in terms of there's no dialogue or discourse related to Drabah, it's almost as if it's is really dependent on those two factors, yeah? So have human rights organizations thought of actually directly uh, working on those issues, developing their own sort of media, um, you know, methods, their own ways of reaching the, you know, the masses, um, working on critical, you know, consciousness raising or something like that at the ground level, um, rather than depending on those moments to actually have them? Um, I can give you a chance to <laughs> <laughs> respond. Try to respond the... <laughs> on Syrian and Palestinians, uh, I mean, we, we actually just put out a report uh, yes or the day before, looking at looking at Palestinians from Syria because they're really vulnerable, mm -hmm. even more so than Syrians. Because Syri I mean, Syrians at least have HCR to protect them. Mm -hmm. But um, so we're working on it. Amnesty R, the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights has taken a case to court, which is going to be before the Council of State on November 19th, which is an interesting case because what's happening for a lot of these Syrians is when the societal backlash that happened July onwards as a result of Yusuf al-Husseini, uh, people who, who, the kind of things they said on television in that week is beyond irresponsible. There was, the Syrians, Syrian refugees have been dependent on the informal economy. And I can't tell you the number of people who lost their jobs, who were kicked out of their apartments, whose children were yelled at by other kids who were beaten in the streets because of, you know, you can really see the power of the media in that moment. And why did that happen? Because of security agency decision making. This malaf has been something, you know, that the that Egyptian intelligence and national security make decisions on, rather than others in the government. And so the decision, they reversed, um, the ability, and they required a visa for Syrians to come in. This incitement happened in the media, 
you get a societal backlash, and then next thing you get Syrians trying to leave on boats because they're so desperate. So they'd rather face drowning than stay in Egypt. And they take the three-year-old children. And then the coast guards who stop the boats then arrest the refugees, and this is why um, so many of them are now in detention. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really horrific situation. And look, the situation for refugees in Egypt has always been pretty horrific. Uh, a combination of uh, sort of racism, in, I mean, in addition to the usual, I mean, economic pressures in any, in any country where things are not good economically, you're always going to get nationals saying they're taking our jobs. I mean, anti-immigrant anti sentiment is nothing new and happens in a, in a lot of Europe. But um, the reason it's, it's so terrible, I think, for Syrians and, and, and Palestinians from Syria is, is because of the, the societal backlash uh, at this point. Um, so, I mean, we're just working against the deportations, uh, trying to get people released from police stations, and trying to get a bit of a reversal in, uh, definitely also in the media discourse. Uh, but it's, it's been a very uphill battle. Um, Awareness of human rights before the revolution, I think uh, it's kind of the argument I was trying to make that we were uh, much more tangential today, not really part of part of public discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think I think for the moments when human rights discourse, so talking about justice, I, mean, I don't mean you know mm -hmm. talking about things qua human rights, but using language that resonates compared to demands of the protest movement. So talking about the rights of martyrs. Um, those were the moments when it became much more mainstream. When the backlash happens, that's when you that's when you lose your power as well. And I think this has also taught us I mean, how dependent we are on the media. Um, and so you're you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, one of the things, in a sense, is a little bit more space I think today in the media compared to three months ago. I think some of the hysteria has died down. Um, some of us are being invited back. We're, we're, they they invite us to talk about laws. That's not controversial. Um, but on Rabah, really, the only, I mean, I did two interviews, one with Geber Amuti and one with Lenny but they were the only two people who invited me. And, um, I think, you know, Yusri Foda is going to come back on screen. I don't know if we're going to s slowly have a little, a little bit more facts-based uh, journalism uh, and, and media presence, as opposed to this official narrative where facts are sort of made up along the way to fit the official narrative. But in terms of alternative media, I mean, Mossarin is the best example, really, of um, a collective of activists whose work is all about documenting police and, and military abuse and other human rights violations. And uh, in the human rights community, we've all try, we're all trying to do more in terms of multimedia and, and use of social media. Because again, Twitter right now is, I think, I mean, Twitter is the minority of the minority, and Facebook is much more influential in Egypt, but at least um, Twitter right now is a much friendlier place when it comes to uh, talking about human rights. You get less of the uh, sort of almost hysterical uh, rejection of any talk about uh, about human rights. Um, professionalism and politicization. Uh, you know, the, there's a, a broader discussion. You know, ultimately, you want to have a human, you want to have a constituency pushing for human rights. If you look at certain countries where um, where mass crimes are taking place, like mass disappearances. You, you need a sort of a constituency of families working together with the human rights community at a very grassroots level to build up that kind of pressure. And so ideally you want to work on awareness raising, you want to work on human rights training, but it kind of depends on the specialization of the organization. And at least for me, you know, the organization I work for the, really only does documentation and advocacy, whereas Amnesty have a membership-based organization, so they do a lot more of that campaign. So there are different models. But I think at the end of the day, you need a professionalization of it because you need documentation is difficult. It's really it takes ages to pull together enough witness testimony and cross check that and try and create a picture. Uh, the kind of stuff that you know, the, the, the one page press release the same day that's the sign of an organization that doesn't do its homework. Um, and, and I think you know, April 6 and, and other groups that talk about arrests are incredibly important. Um, I think what, what we bring is, if A, you have the human rights lawyers who go on and uh, try and get them out, uh, you have the pattern documentation of these arrests are increasing, and then you try and, and lobby at the state level, um, and, but you need both. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, please. Um, thank you for your persistence. 
<laughs> Never knowing who, who will be your enemy next, because it's incredible to think about this yo-yo story that you've had over the last few years. And I have, um, I have a question, but I also have a plug. And the plug is because you've really made the point that it's going to be up to citizens. I mean, if this is never going to get better, we're not going to be able to leave it to governments or elected parliaments. It's going to be that we change the culture. Uh, and next Monday at 1 o'clock here on campus, uh, a Northern Ireland activist who's been in the human rights field fighting this fight for 25 years is going to talk about what citizens did in Northern Ireland uh, to really push back and to insist on inclusion and insist on, stop, on stopping the violence from wherever it came from. Uh, and that's at the conference center in P007, 1 o'clock on Monday. Her name is Abela Kilmurray, and she's amazing. She's funny. The question is, you your finger on this hysteria that broke out in, in July and August in the country. And I don't think it's justified by the crimes of Morsi or the Muslim Brotherhood over that past year. One year, first of all, is a very short time. They weren't doing anything much more egregious than, you know, SCAF or Mubarak or anyone else had done. What do you think accounts for this visceral, irrational, <coughs> hatred and anger and readiness to eliminate a huge sector of our population instead of to say, how do we rehabilitate them? How do we change them? How do we bring them back? <laughs> I don't get it. Yes. Um, I want to shed more light on the such case uh, like constitution. Uh, that's uh, considered the biggest crime which we meet in the, in the, uh, through the Egyptian uh, this, uh, this year, uh, uh, especially uh, the uh, the committee of 50, uh, 50 is not representative to the uh, Egyptians. Okay, uh, so what is, what can we uh, do as uh, civilians or Egyptians to um, to pass this point or to uh, to express our opinion, even if uh, the, mo the majority of Egyptians are not educated, and they have the uh, they are to vote and they will. Um, uh, we will make. Uh, um, uh, they will uh, uh, represent the majority of groups. And we will finally, say yes or no. Okay. So another yes. Uh, yes. Um, with you, I was thinking about the whole situation and about the ways to get out of it. So um, I'm interested to know your uh, opinion about the National Council of Human Rights in Egypt and. Is there um, is there um, we we are thinking of strengthening the role in Egypt? Do you think this could be possible or doable in the in the next period? Um, I'm going to take one more. Yeah. So um, you've talked a lot about Rabah and. Uh, the disproportionate use of force by the authorities there are incidents prior to that. One of the counter-attacks that are normally being launched against this case disproportionate is varying definitions of proportionality and claiming, mm -hmm. claiming that proportionality needs to be more towards the anticipated uh, violence rather than to the actual violence. And a lot of debate around that. I was interested if you could shed some more light on your methodology in assessing proportionality and compared to the long state. Okay. <laughs> Always easy questions. <laughs> um, I'm going to start <laughs> with hysteria. I mean, that Northern Ireland conversation should also be interesting because I've been, like, spoken to policing experts from Northern Ireland. I mean, they had protesters throwing Molotov cocktails at them and other serious stuff, and yet they've somehow reformed their police force after, you know, a very brutal police force as well at times. So it, it kind of gives me hope um, that one day. Um, the hysteria, I mean, I think part of it was genuine and part of it was, was very strategic. I was getting scared of Morsi towards the end. And, and I'm really not Islamophobic at all. Um, I was getting scared like when the lynching of the Shia happened the week before. But, but, but that doesn't justify, I agree with you, it doesn't justify the hysteria. And that's why I think it was a combination of the fact that, that you know, there was a plan. And the plan 
were also involved reaching out to all the private media stations ahead of June 30th saying, if you don't support what's going to happen, you will be arrested. Morsi plans to arrest you. And I've heard this from people that want to be And we need you on board. And I mean, they were also ideologically, in any case, uh, opposed to Morsi. But I think, really, the media in the first few days, uh, in the first couple of weeks, played a huge role in, in keeping hysteria levels high, in exaggerating violence on the part of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to make it appear like there was a coordinated uh, plan uh, across the country and that the violence in Sinai was all part of, uh, was all on Brotherhood orders. I think the rise of, uh, you know, I think Nasserists in positions of power and decision making uh, who are very uh, opposed to the to human rights discourse in and of itself. Um, hyper nationalism, uh, obviously <coughs> support of the military, um, uh, not questioning the military, uh, fed uh, combined with the kind of xenophobia and conspiracy theories that are out there. It's just a lethal recipe, basically. And I think. The Brotherhood's decision making also uh, not helped keep that alive, but played into the hands of those wanting to maintain this um, this single narrative. Um, but it wasn't all. I mean, it wasn't all the instructions. You get people like you know Amini Khayat who does this out of conviction. So it's 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 much more than just instructions. Um, but we need a good system. Psychologist. Psychologist as well, yeah. The Committee of 50 is not representative of business in Egypt, I would say. Uh, it is representative in another way. The interesting thing about this Committee of 50 is that no single group commands a vote. It, different to the Brotherhood's Constituent Assembly. And the Brotherhood's Constituent Assembly, you could talk as much as you want, the Brotherhood knew what they wanted in the Constitution. In the end, they really didn't matter. Any of these public hearing sessions and put didn't matter, they were going to put it on the table. So you had to negotiate with private if you wanted something. This time, I don't think there's a single group that can push forward all the text that's what they want. So this is why the negotiations are this painful, because you have multiple interest groups, and each interest group wants to protect its own institution's uh, status in the institution. I think the problem with the committee is political. I think the problem with the committee is that it excludes, uh, that it excludes the government. And I think that's the same mistake that Morsi made in 2012. Uh, a constitution doesn't buy you stability, it's the process. And for the process, you need buy-in. Um, but that's part of, you know, it's bigger than just the constitution. It's going to be the same question with the elections, will the brother be allowed to run or not? And, and the NCHR, I am in, always in favor of trying to find pressure points within the system. I don't work by saying, I will not speak to anyone because they are all murderers. That doesn't really help with the little human rights battles you want to fight. And some people within the NCHR, you know, think Abitabi Dabi Kraj Amran is from the Human Rights Committee. So, from the Independent Human Rights Committee. There are some others who are from the Non-Independent Human Rights Committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, no, I know that there are some people in there who really care about police abuse and who really are fighting those battles. But will that be enough for a big picture? I don't know. But I, I, I would be in favor of uh, strengthening them, but also calling them out if they produce a report that is uh, problematic. Uh, they're also calling them out. Uh, 30 seconds of proportionality. <laughs> it's not just a question of proportionality. The question is, you know, if, if throughout the day, I mean, the dispersal took from about uh, 6.30 a.m. until uh, around 6 p.m. Uh, there was shooting. We know that very early in the morning, you know, so, so the, the analysis is not just about, um, it's about how